Hey, welcome back to another episode of Parker's Pensies or Ponce's. I know all the folks get upset about that. Uh, this is a podcast where we explore thoughts and philosophy, theology, nature, and life. I love thinking about cool stuff, so come think with me. I really appreciate all the support that you guys have been giving me on YouTube, all the subscribers and people leaving comments. Please keep that up. Please share these with your friends. Um, the goal for this whole podcast is to bring on people who have way more wisdom in, in different fields than I do and uh, expose them to you guys. And so it'd be great if you would share these and give them a like and all that good stuff. Uh, if you've benefited from this podcast, please consider becoming a patron over at uh, Patreon. You can find the link in the description. You can also find um, me at Apple Podcasts, and you could leave me a five-star review and a comment. That would be huge. Today, uh, I have another special guest, and we're going to be talking about his new book. So I have Dr. John Peckham, and we're going to be talking about his new book, Divine Attributes, Knowing the Covenantal God of Scripture. This is awesome. This book's really, really good. This is how you write a Divine Attributes book. So without further ado, let me just pull him in. Dr. Peckham, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me, Parker. Looking forward to it. Yeah, yeah. So um, I can't remember. Did this... I got a I got a, a copy of this book from the publishers, which is awesome. Is this book live? Can people buy this now? Yeah, it's out now. It's officially released now. Awesome, it's awesome. released on May 6th or something. It's been about, about a week. Okay. Uh, how long of a, of a project was this for you? Um, it was a big project. The, the writing of the constructive book for, for Baker probably took about a year. But yeah. before that, I wrote a different book that was more of a discussion of the different models of God in the contemporary conversation for TNT Clark. Yeah. So when you combine those two, it was a was a longer research project. But yeah. this book is focusing on a constructive treatment. So probably probably about a year writing. Well, it's crazy because the amount of footnotes uh I got lost in them because you, you mentioned everyone. I, well, I wonder if he if he's read Ronald Nash. And then, oh, he's read Ronald Nash, too. Well, holy cow. So that was really awesome. But then also, the amount of scripture and scripture references is insane. It was, as I was going through it, it was like devotional for me. It was really encouraging to have that much scripture and be saturated with it, even though I'm trying to think deeply and philosophically. It was just a reminder, hey, don't do that uh, without the Bible. So that was really, really, I thank you for doing that. Mm. Yeah, thank you for saying that. That's one of the things I'm trying to do in all of my work. Uh, some of my previous work was, one of my previous books is called Canonical Theology, which lays out a uh, canonical method for doing theology. Mm -hmm. And I just believe that our, our theology, systematic theology included, should be based on scripture as the rule of faith, as a uniquely normative rule, which means that we should have biblical warrant uh, for the conclusions we reach dogmatically. Mm -hmm. And also they should be systematically coherent as well. And those are the two standards I'm trying to aim at throughout the book biblical warrant and systematic coherence. And I try to deal with the issues in the contemporary conversation in a way that doesn't run ahead of what I can claim on the basis of biblical warrant. There are other models that could be constructed beyond that, that answer questions beyond the ones I'm trying to answer, but I'm trying to put forward a kind of minimal account of what scripture teaches with regards to these divine attributes uh, without trying to answer all of the questions. So not minimalistic, not less than what scripture teaches, uh, but I'm trying to lay out that model that's consistent with scripture being employed as a rule all the way through, not just at the level of individual claims, but even at the level of a metaphysical understanding of what God is like. Yeah, I, I seriously appreciate that. I, I It's gonna be hard for me not to just keep blowing smoke at you here. Uh, it's it's really impressive and really encouraging because a lot of times people will have one or the other. They'll have scripture, and that's really cool. But we've also had like 2,000 years of people talking about this. What have people said? And then others will just go the historical route, and this is what the church has always said, so you must believe it. Mm -hmm. And then others will just go, hey, you know, that's history be damned. This is what I think, and I'm right or I'm wrong or, you know, it, it's – I really appreciated seeing the amount of people you you interacted with as well as as scripture. It was just so, so refreshing. So I, I definitely commend this book to everyone listening right now. Um, but before we get into like the, the specifics, I wanted to go over some of the specific attributes. Um, you already kind of alluded to it or mentioned it already, but I wanted to ask uh, like a prolegomena question. Uh, what roles do scripture, history, and philosophy play in thinking about the divine attributes? They, they all seem like normative constraints and in informants, but who wins when uh, when they're at odds with each other? Right. Yeah. Great question. So the way I'm viewing it, I am treating scripture as a rule that shouldn't be ruled by anything else, a rule commissioned by God to function as uniquely normative. 
So anything else that has authority still has to be submissive to the claims of Scripture, which means that Scripture has to be allowed to rule, again, not only at the level of individual claims, but even at the level of our metaphysical understanding of what God is like. And so I often use the phrase canonical to, to try to, to lay out what I mean by that succinctly. And that means that Scripture is, is canonical in the sense of being a rule, canonical in the sense of being a rule or standard, canonical in the sense that it's uh, a unified corpus, I believe, not uniform, but unified. And it is canonical because it's commissioned by God. So it's canonical in virtue of being divinely commissioned. So if God gives uh, a rule in Scripture that everything else must be subjected to or measured by, right? If you, if you use the analogy of a canon like a reed, which mm -hmm. is kind of the etymology of, of the word canon, uh, so if everything is to be measured by that, then that is the standard that is unique uh, and, if necessary, can correct other standards and other helps. Now, other tools are very important to the task because none of us think in a vacuum. None of us have a traditionless understanding. But where I would draw the line is where a tradition becomes normative in a way that scripture cannot challenge or question it. So we can learn with tradition without making the tradition itself finally normative in a way that cannot be challenged. And of course, different people are going to come from different traditions, mm -hmm. and there's going to be even different interpretations of those traditions. But I think all of them should be judged intentionally by what scripture actually lays out uh, exegetically, not, at the, not only at the level of individual texts, but taking scripture as a whole. So I'm really looking for claims that meet the standard of biblical warrant, that, that just means theological claims are adequately grounded in what scripture affirms. Mm -hmm. And the corollary to that is that it also needs to be systematically coherent uh, because I believe God doesn't contradict himself. And if the Bible is God's word, it also won't contradict itself. So if we actually have a contradiction, not just a tension, sometimes there's mysteries that remain, uh, but if there's an actual contradiction, I think we've misunderstood something. So those twin standards of, of biblical warrant and systematic coherence um, so I think it, I think it's very important to uphold those two claims, uh, with scripture being the rule without in any way dismissing or just avoiding the, the long history of Christian interpretation and Christian theology, but bringing that into dialogue with what is actually taught in scripture, I think is crucial for us, uh, to build a constructive theology, uh, at least one that is, is submissive to the claim of scripture as the rule. Yeah, man, that's so good. That's so encouraging. I love that. Um, do you use? I don't know if I if I saw it in there or not. Do you, do you like or use the language of of Norma Normans and Norma Normata? Is that is yeah. that is that helpful language to continue to, to use? I think it is helpful. Yeah, I use it. I don't use it in this book, I think, but I use it in canonical theology for that for that very idea. It's the rule that is not ruled, or the norm that cannot be normed by anything else. That doesn't mean nothing else is authoritative in any sense. It just means that those other authorities have to be subjected to scripture. Yeah. And I think one of the problems that, that we some, sometimes have is, is there are some who would claim that this or that aspect of the tradition is normative interpretatively. Right. And my question for that kind of a view is, well, in what sense could scripture actually challenge it if you actually have to interpret scripture through that lens? Right. Uh, and of course, it's true that none of us in interpret scripture without any lens. Mm -hmm. But ideally, we would recognize that we all bring lenses and then become as aware as possible of what those lenses are and subject them to scripture. We can never do all, all of what we bring to scripture. This is a continual process, a hermeneutical spiral, mm -hmm. as many people have referred to it. Um, and I, I have no problem with recognizing there are lenses we bring, but I think even the lenses need to be subjected to scrutiny that is subjected to scripture. Yeah, I think that's great. And I always think of it as, um, you know, sure, I'm, I'm very uh, firm in my convictions, but uh, they're always open to being corrected by scripture. Even if I, I, I can't see how, how this view can be corrected by scripture, but if someone can come along and convince me, it's probably really hard for me to give this up and stuff, but I'm, I'm open. At least I have to say that I'm open to that being normed by scripture. Yeah, I think, I think that's exactly right. And that's why you'll find, hopefully, hopefully I've done it successfully. I try to even make claims in qualified language that leaves room for further understanding, room for correction. It might be this way. This is my best understanding now. And I, I try to, in any claim that I make confidently, I want it to be, to meet kind of three, three standards. It should be discernible in the text. Like I could show you why I think this is warranted. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's demonstrable. I could demonstrate to someone else how I arrive at that conclusion. 
from the teachings of scripture. That doesn't mean you need verbatim text, but that this is actually arises from what scripture is actually teaching as a whole. And it is defensible. So if you challenge me and say, well, what about this, that, and that, I can defend it. That doesn't mean that that convinces you or you necessarily agree with me, but mm-hmm. I at least can meet those, those three standards to have a confident view, which is still subject to correction. It's still not dogmatic. I think anything that we say about God, especially at the level of interpretation, is going to be provisional because we are fallible. I believe scripture is infallible, but my interpretations are are fallible. And so I always want to be open to correction going forward. And so even when I, I make a claim about something that I think is a confident interpretation, even that could turn out to be wrong. And I'm sure there's there's things that I have gotten wrong and I continue to learn every time I go back to scripture to try to understand and learn from others as well. Yeah. Uh, but that, that's the goal. Yeah. So just, just to clarify, the the I'm always shaky on the language. So the, the scripture is the Norma Normans, Nor, Normans. That's the thing that the norming norm. Is that the right language? I think so. Yeah. Well, Latin is not my specialty, but yeah, it's yeah. norm that cannot be normed by anything else, right? Yeah. And, yeah, the and norm, history is usually norm, like normans, the, non normata. So it's not normed by anything else. Yeah. yeah. And then I, I guess history or tradition would be like the Norma Normata, the, the normed norm, the thing that is normed. It's a norm, but it's normed by scripture. Right. Tradition, even 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 one's faculty of reason, which is fallible, would itself be normed. Uh, we can't interpret scripture without using our faculty of reason. Mm-hmm. But even our reason is fallible and we totally. need to, to, to be humble even in that sense. Yeah. Amen. It's so refreshing to hear that. It's, that's that's so awesome. Uh, one more thing before we get in. Um, the covenantal God of scripture and the God of the philosophers. And this this uh, pops up here and there uh, throughout the book and then uh, especially in the last chapter. I was really interested in this that the god of the philosophers is the god of strict classical theism uh or 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 is it the the god of strict classical theism this this is kind of ironic to me because a lot of the i think you're right but it was just it was jarring at first because a lot of the really strict classical theists i know today are way more bound by history or, or historical philosophy or the philosophy of the fourth century or something like that and they will charge the um, what, what's called neoclassical theists or, or moderate classical theists or whatever, uh, mutual, theistic mutualists. They'll charge them with with being bound to philosophy or process the uh, philosophy or something. So I, I thought that was interesting that you, you'd say that the strict classical theists are that God is the God of the philosopher. Is that right? Or am I, am I misinterpreting what, what you said? Yeah, well, I want to qualify qualify that a bit, right? Sure. So in much of the contemporary literature, when people say the God of the philosophers, they mean strict classical theism. Okay. But it would be a mistake to think that strict classical theism is the only so-called God of the philosophers. Yeah. So process, philosoph- process theology, I should say, is equally a God of the philosophers, right? Mm-hmm. And so I, I try to point out in the chapter, when you say God of the philosophers, you have to say, which God of the philosophers are yeah. we talking about, right? Strict classical theism is, is, is identified by many as a view that is very influenced by particular streams of Greek philosophy. And this is well recognized by proponents uh, and critics of strict classical theism. So it's by no means the only God of the philosophers. And I don't use that in any way as a defeater. Uh, that would be an instance of genetic fallacy and say, well, because it's influenced by Greek philosophy, therefore it's wrong. Right. And secondarily, I don't put forward anything like a kind of exaggerated Hellenization thesis, which is the view that there's some monolith- monolithic Greek philosophy and the early church fathers uncritically uh, borrowed from it in a way that went against the claims of scripture. I'm not making that particular claim. And in fact, my, I don't intend uh, to make any dogmatic claim in that regard, mm-hmm. except to say that I think even those who reject that more uh, exaggerated Hellenization thesis uh, that goes back to Harnack and others, mm-hmm. even many of them would recognize that there has been influence of streams of Greek philosophy, not a monolithic Greek philosophy, that has been critically appropriated by the church tradition. But the question is whether uh, all of the appropriations of that philosophy are actually consistent with scripture or not. And different theologians are going to disagree on that particular point. And there's going to be different aspects of the tradition that are more or less beholden to different streams of Greek philosophy. So that's not a defeater in saying that because it's influenced by these streams, it's therefore wrong. But I think we also shouldn't say because it's influenced by these streams, it's therefore right, Right. including even even the early church tradition, uh, which also isn't monolithic. Uh, There is what seems to be majority view views and views that that cluster around kind of central themes. But but that doesn't mean that they are necessarily true. Uh, and I, and I want to steer clear of adding uh, an, another final normative standard beyond scripture, 
which would require, I think, a kind of strong claim to inspiration. But there's there's a lot of messiness in early church history. All you have to do is, is study it a little bit to recognize this is the case, which doesn't mean we can't learn from it. Uh, but I do think that it is open to correction. And I think, uh, it's not just what I think, even many of the early church fathers themselves will say that you should take scripture as an authority different than us. Uh, that is uh, uniquely normative in a way that our writings are, are not. So I think even within the tradition itself, you have this very high view of scripture on its own pedestal, so to speak, that everything else is to be judged by. So somebody can make the claim for a particular aspect of the tradition and say, well, I just think it is consistent with scripture. Great. Let's see then the biblical warrant for how those things fit together. But I think if you work the other way around and just say, we're going to assume that this set of Christian tradition is consistent with scripture, then we're no longer allowing scripture to potentially norm that tradition. That that's a great point. That's uh, that's really really encouraging. I we I'm so excited about because we need to hear this. People need to get this uh, in their heads. Like this is how it should be done. Um, okay, so you give this constructive your your own constructive accounts of the the divine attributes, um, and it's called it's it's covenantal theism, or it's, or it's it's you know, is it going by that name? Is that is that fair to say that your view is you call your view covenantal theism? Yeah, I'm labeling my particular view that I advocate for this book in covenantal theism, for lack of a better term. Mm -hmm. It is consistent with what, with what some call neoclassical theism. That's Ryan Mullen's terminology, yep. and I appreciate his work very much. Uh, others might call it a moderate classical theism. Um, I don't use those labels because some who self-identify as classical theists are strict classical theists, and they say that's the only kind of classical theism that is worthy of the label. Yeah. And I, I don't want to... In, in, engage in that particular dispute, uh, but many also identify as classical theists who will reject some aspects of strict classical theism, like timelessness or a strict version of impassibility, but they still want to call themselves classical theists in the sense they believe God is transcendent, necessary, perfect, omniscient, omnipotent, uh, etc. right? These kinds of, of core, what some people call core classical attributes or core attributes of God, uh, I think the way that Tom Morris once put it. In that broad sense, classical theism is much broader than strict classical theism. So I use covenantal theism to, to, uh, to try to capture that God engages in back and forth relationship with creation while remaining utterly distinct and transcendent yeah. over creation, right? Yeah. And so there's an imminence and a transcendence. The imminence is voluntary where God uh, voluntarily enters into a relationship with creation that actually makes a difference to God on the one hand. So it's relational in that sense but it's not a relational theology like, say, process theology, where God is essentially dependent upon some world or essentially related to the world. It's a voluntary relationship because God freely creates the world. He doesn't have to create the world, and then he freely enters into relationship. On the other hand, it uh, robustly affirms the creator-creature distinction. Mm -hmm. And so God is distinct from the world, independent of the world, transcendent over the world, exists entirely of himself and doesn't depend on the world to be essentially who he is. And so there, this is a broad kind of, 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 of view, or there is a broad spectrum, I should say, of views that reject both process theism, or at least apart from process theism, and apart from strict classical theism. And there's not really a good label for this middle section of views, unless you like a label like, like neoclassical theism, mm -hmm. but there's not an established label for this view. Because if you simply call it relational, people are going to think you're talking about something like process theology right. or Moltmann's, Moltmann's view or something like that, which falls prey, at least in my view, to, to very strong critiques and problems with regard to the creator-creature distinction. Uh, but if you just say it's classical, then people think you're talking about strict classical theism. Yeah. So in this broad camp, there's not really a good label unless you call it neoclassical or moderate classical theism. Uh, I call it covenantal to be a descriptive term that God is relational, uh, but relational as a sovereign. Yeah. <clears throat> it, um, if people start going around calling themselves uh, covenantal uh, theologians, or well, let me think, uh, covenantal th theists, uh, following following your work is that is that weird for you? Did you just start a movement, or is that is that cool? Is that something that you'd be like, yeah, this is great. I'm I'm glad to see more people. You know, if I'm I'm a Peck, Peckhamian, uh, yeah, uh, covenantal theist. I haven't thought about that at all because I don't think it's very likely to happen at all. <laughs> well, after this podcast, who knows? <laughs> I think it's more likely that there will be some kind of label for the for the middle category. And yeah. even then, I would call my own view something different because there will be nuances that not right. everyone who holds that middle category might want to affirm. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so I could broadly fall within that middle label, but then there's some distinct contributions that I'm making that 
everyone who holds that label might not affirm. And so I, I've thought about maybe just calling that view in the middle relational and classical theism, where the and is an important uh, uh, linking term that holds them together. But that's probably not going to satisfy many people either. It's relational in some respects, it's classical in others, but it departs from relational theology as as say process theology uh, defines it and departs from strict classical theism in significant ways. And Ryan Mullins and I are, are co-editing a series together uh, that's gonna be published with, with Cascade mm -hmm. that is trying to make contributions within this kind of, of middle camp uh, that is arguing for this view that is relational in some respects and classical in others, at least in the sense of God being transcendent creator of the world that isn't uh, dependent upon the world in any way. So I don't know what label will end up end up uh, taking over there. Maybe Mullen's label of neoclassical theism uh, will will carry the day, uh, mm -hmm. but I'm sure some classical theists will will push back on that on that label. But I do want to be clear here that uh, even though this view falls between those poles. Uh, I'm not doing theology methodologically like, well, let me take these polls and then try to find a synthesis or a middle view or some kind of Hegelian synthesis. That's not what I'm doing at all. I'm landing here on divine attributes because I believe this is what, where there's biblical warrant for these conclusions. And it happens to depart from strict classical theism in some ways and also departs in massive ways from what are sometimes labeled relational theologies, which is why I don't think it, it neatly fits in either category. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's that's really helpful to 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 preempt a lot of the uh, criticism. Also, it's it's good to hear that you're working with with uh, Dr. Mullins on that because if not, maybe he's he'd come out with a paper. You know, the difficulty of demarcating John Peckham's yeah, covenantal theism. He's he's dangerous when it comes to to terms and, and making sure you know what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, it's great. I, lo I love Ryan. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. So let's let's jump in on a couple uh, a couple of these questions. Uh, I got eight of them. I don't know if we'll be able to make through all of them. But they're, they're questions to kind of draw out your, your particular take on or your constructive take on the divine attributes. So we've already talked about this already with, with relational. Uh, we've, we've broached the topic. But does God change? Yeah. So I think there is uh, many important senses in which God does not change and also important senses in which God does change. So a strict conception of immutability is going to say that God cannot change in any way whatsoever. And I think that uh, at least there's a significant biblical warrant for the claim that God, God does change in some ways. Mm -hmm. So often the claim that God doesn't change at all uh, by those that are trying to ground their claim in scripture, one of the first texts that people will appeal to is Malachi 3.6, where God says to his people, he says, I am the Lord, I change not, or I do not change. And many people stop reading right there and they say, well, there it is. God just doesn't change and therefore God's strictly immutable. It's open and, cut, open, open and shut case. Uh, but I think we need to keep reading because the very next words in that verse are, therefore, you are not consumed, O sons of Israel. So already that statement is in the context of some relationship. And then the very next verse, God says, return to me and I will return to you. So it's suggested even in that very text that there is some very significant sense in which God does not change. And also God changes relationally. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and there's many, many other biblical texts and I think biblical warrant for this type of view. But I refer to this, I'm not the only one, but I refer to this as qualified immutability, which is just the view that God is immutable or changeless with regard to his essential, essential nature and character, but changes relationally in relation to the world because he has freely opened himself up to relationship with the world. So he's immutable in some respects, his character and essential nature but also changes relationally, which means he can enter into covenantal back and forth relationship. He can do new things. He can have experiences, uh, et cetera. Yeah, I think that's great. Um, uh, Ryan Mullins, he, he, I guess he used to use that kind of language and said, uh, Keith Yandel, you know, knocked that out of him. And so he just goes, no, 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 uh, not, not immu immutability. But I'm glad to hear you say that because I, I do like the terminology of qualified immutability. I think that's what scripture is picking out. It doesn't seem like it's picking out the, the strict classical theist sense of no change whatsoever, absolutely not. If there's any change, then you're a relational theist, and we mean that in the bad way, and you're following, uh, you know, North Whitehead. So it seems like what Scripture is picking out is that he, his character does not change, and and from that, I think we could probably, you know, uh, say his 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 uh, essential nature because that's his character. You know, it, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. But yeah, it, it seems you get all these problems if you want to say that God's 
God's knowledge doesn't change. You know, uh, William and Craig enters the chat and says, you know, hey, we, God has tense knowledge or he doesn't. And, and if he doesn't, there's all these problems. Also, I think the, a big one is God as creator. So like before he created, yes, um, he, he wasn't in relation to a creation. And then he created something. And now there he's now he's creator. Right. But that didn't change his essential attributes. Right. That's right. That's right. It, yeah. It, it appears like if God creates that the world is not eternal and God creates the world ex nihilo, that God being creator is a contingent or accidental property of God, mm -hmm. uh, which is going to be some kind of a change. And if you go a step further and God enters into relationship with creation, a back and forth covenant relationship, the way it's depicted, uh, then he's going to to engage in relational changes. But that's not going to change essentially who he is. Mm -hmm. right? Even if God's uh, experience, what I might call God's experiential knowledge changes because the world is changing. The God's property of being omniscient doesn't change. He's right. always all knowing, right? He always has the property of knowing all things that can be known. He's always all powerful. He's not becoming lesser or greater. So I think there are, and I wouldn't try to enumerate what, what they all are, because I think that gets into the mystery of the, of the essence of God. But I do think there are essential attributes or essential perfections or essential characteristics of God that the Bible affirms that do not change, including God's character. And this is why it makes sense to say things like the New Testament says that God cannot deny himself. I think that not only means he cannot deny himself like by lying or, or breaking with his good character, but there's just things true about God that couldn't be otherwise. Mm -hmm. And so it avoids some, some kind of a, a thoroughgoing kind of kind of voluntarism uh, where th there is some, some essential truths about God and they are always unchanging. God is always the same in those respects. But at the same time, God does enter into relationship with creation. He has the capacity for relationality and he does freely enter into relationship with creation. And this allows us to make sense of actually affirming that God does all the kinds of things that scripture depicts him as doing in the biblical narratives, mm -hmm. which is really all that, I, all that I'm wanting to affirm. Whatever metaphysical claims I make about God, I want them to be able to say, yes, God did this, God did that, God related to creatures in that way. Not in a literalistic sense, all of this language is accommodative to be sure there are it's it's speaking to us at a level we can understand and yet if it is infallible and inspired by god it is still true in what it affirms right even figurative language still conveys something mm -hmm. and so it's not a matter of taking it literalistically it's a matter of what does it convey exegetically even after you recognize uh, whatever the genre is, uh, whether it's figurative, whether it's a metaphor, uh, even even if it's literal, so to speak, it's still going to be accommodative. Uh, but that doesn't answer the question as to whether or not it applies to God. And so I think we need to take the exegetical upshot of what scripture is teaching about God seriously and actually say, well, this is what God is like. And the way God reveals himself in the economy uh, has to be consistent with the way God actually is in himself. Now, very important caveat. I don't mean by that that God is reduced to the way He reveals Himself in the economy. Yeah, so because in the Rauner's rule, we're, we're we're dangerously close to Rauner's rule or some kind of conception of, yeah, yeah. of Rauner's rule. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This this is what I want to avoid. There, there shouldn't be a collapse of God as He in, as He is in Himself uh, to what God is in relation to the world. God is always more than that. Uh, but whatever is true of God in relation to the world has to be consistent with what God is like in and of himself. Mm -hmm. So if it's actually true that God enters into back and forth relationship, that has to be consistent with the way God is in and of himself. He has to have the capacity for that relationship, in other words. Yeah. That doesn't mean he, he's necessarily in relationship. It means he has to have the ability. And then yes. if he exercises that ability by creating a world and then chooses to allow that world to affect him, then then that, that capability is actualized, so to speak. Yeah. But in a way that doesn't change God essentially. That's that's really good. I mean, I, I agree with you. I totally agree. I'm just thinking of the, the Thomists in my head who are like, okay, so then you're saying that God has potentiality and he's moved from potentiality to actuality, so he can't be pure act. And you're saying, well, yeah, I never said God was pure act, right? Is that is that just how you... Yeah, you yeah, I, yeah I, I would say that the view that God is pure act without any accidental properties, with only actuality, without any potentiality, I just don't see a way that that is consistent with what the biblical narratives and the biblical claims affirm about God. Now, I know there are theological ways that people who affirm that try to argue it's consistent with scripture. And I deal with some of those in the book. Yeah. Uh, I just don't think that any of those work. I don't mean to cast aspersions on people coming from that view. Uh, they're welcome to make their case. And I'm not trying to flippantly just dismiss it as if yeah. there's nothing that can be said on that front. Uh, but I personally don't find it convincing. I do, however, affirm define aseity, but, but defined as a view that God's existent 
uh, God's existence is not dependent upon creation and God's mm-hmm. essential nature is not dependent upon creation. So God exists entirely of himself. He I- exists of himself uh, without any need for any creation. And theoretically, he could have created nothing and he would still be the God who he essentially is. Mm-hmm. Uh, so in that sense, God is ase. I believe this is a, a, a firm biblical teaching. But I don't think there's any biblical warrant for the conclusion of pure actuality. I think that's motivated by other considerations and other conclusions people reach because they think they are necessary for a particular metaphysical story. Yeah. And uh, and it's fine for people to hold those views again, uh, but I don't think that they are consistent with the depictions of God. I think you have to then say uh, those depictions of God are not actually truly depicting God in relationship with the world. Yeah. And that goes beyond merely saying they're accommodative. All language that is understandable by humans is going to be accommodative in some sense from God's perspective. Would you, would you, I think you do say it's, it's analogical, right? Is that the, the, the language you're using for accommodation? Yes. Accommodative and analogical. There is an is and an is not a similarity and a dissimilarity. Yeah. But what I worry is, is some particular metaphysical understandings of God. I worry that they border on taking such language as equivocal, yep. not as analogical anymore. And yeah. there's a big spectrum of analogy between univocity, right? and equivocity. Mm -hmm. And I think that we should stick close to the upshot of the biblical language without conflating God to that language, always recognizing there's a a, a yes and a no. Sometimes scripture gives us explicit hermeneutical controls as to where there's a difference and where there's similarity. But I would say there's also going to be dissimilarity beyond what is explicitly revealed, but I'm not going to try to claim that I know what the extent of similarity or dissimilarity is. I'm just going to say, well, these are the teachings. Uh, These are true teachings about God and they're consistent with God as he is. And there's some different, some mystery involved there. Uh, But I can still affirm this is, this is true teaching kind of analogous to the way that um, I can teach my 10 year old son about God. And at least if, if my understanding of God is true and I'm a good enough teacher, I can teach him at a level in words he can understand such Mm -hmm. that the teaching remains true. But it's not complete. It's not exhaustive. It's not comprehensive. And it would be a mistake to reduce God to that level of understanding, that level of teaching. Of course, God is, uh, that's just an analogy between me and my 10 year old son, but there's a a much larger gap, right? A huge ontological gap between (laughs) God, who's the creator and all creatures, including any creaturely understanding or human language. And so I think it's important to affirm analogy, but I don't think we should use analogy in a way that makes us say, well, then we just can't come to any kind of confident claims about God, because I'm afraid that that evacuates the Bible of having this normativity of revelation about God. Yeah, that's 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 really great. I love the analogy with your son. I'm sure that your language with your son probably includes a lot more archetypal, ectypal, and, and different language than than uh, someone else would with with their son teaching about God. But um, I thought that was really helpful. Just just, um, just following up with that that train of thought. Do you do you then? I, I actually well, I'm not sure if I saw it or not. Do you? have a qualified simplicity or do you say, Hey, look, we have a and that's, that's really what simplicity is trying to pick out anyways. So we can just drop that term or sticking with the theme. Is it, is it a, a constructive account of, of simplicity? Yeah. I deal with it br- briefly in the, in the chapter on the Trinity. Mm. Um, and I don't, I don't take a dogmatic position except that I don't think that uh, what some people consider the traditional doctrine of simplicity, what Tom McCall calls strict simplicity. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't see a way that that is consistent with, the way God is portrayed in scripture as the covenantal God who enters into back and forth relationship. Um, If you mean by simplicity, uh, something like, um, like Chris's parsimonious simplicity, Paul calls uh, generic simplicity. Mm -hmm. Uh, If you just mean that God is, is a unity and God isn't composed of more fundamental parts. uh, I think that's right. I think that's true. Uh, But I don't think we, I, I, I don't see a way to consistently hold, that there are no distinctions in God whatsoever. I know even advocates of strict simplicity don't like that particular way of framing it. Right, right. Uh, uh, but I, I don't think we should affirm. I, I don't. I'm not sure it makes sense to affirm that God is identical with His attributes or perfections, and all of them are identical with one another. Um, and uh, a strong doctrine of simplicity actually entails, as far as I can see, uh, that God is strictly timeless, strictly immutable, strictly impassable. And if scripture teaches something different, which which I'm convinced that it does, uh, 
then at least consistent with my own methodology, I'm not at liberty to accept strict simplicity. And so some will say, oh, no, 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 there's only one doctrine of simplicity. Anybody who talks about other kinds of simplicity doesn't know what they're talking about. And I would just say, okay, well, you know, go, go read McCall and Crisp and you can argue with them. I think, I think there's room for diversity of definitions, which is why I try to use qualifiers to be charitable to everybody in the conversation. Yeah. Uh, but I think God is one. There's only one and only one God. And we, have to, we need to have a strong sense of divine unity. And I take that to be the main uh, desideratum of, of the tradition with regard to simplicity. And I think that is right. But I think there are some other metaphysical conclusions, some that are held more robustly, some, some more weakly, right? I mean, uh, at least I think Gregory of Nyssa, at least according to McCall, holds what he considers as generic simplicity. Yeah. So there isn't a monolithic tradition on this point as well. Again, there might be a majority school of thought, but it's not monolithic. And so I think there should be room for diversity of views. Um, if simplicity only means strict simplicity, which some people argue it does, then I would deny simplicity and just say unity. Yeah. Uh, but if simplicity means God is one in a very strong sense and not composed of more fundamental parts, uh, like a parsimonious simplicity or something like that, uh, that might turn out to be right. Yeah. But I think the the language is so fraught, the argument is, is so much that that I would just be more co comfortable saying God is a unity, an unbreakable unity. Yeah, yeah. Doctor McCall uh, in. In his Trinity and Atonement class, he got me with the with the Gregories, and so I thought, okay, okay, so I, I probably have to hold some form of of Trinity of uh, simplicity, but then you know, not probably not dull as all, uh, in, in what what he's saying, but I, I appreciate what you what you've said here because you're actually you you're agreeing with a lot of the classical guys that I've talked with, in that simplicity is important for strict uh, classical theism. You're just saying I don't want to go that route. I don't think the Bible brings us that route, and I th I'm, I'm probably on your side. Sorry, everyone else, but. I think they're, they're probably right too. They're, they just want all the other attributes. They don't want, they want strong immutability and they want um, all, all the classical theistic, strict classical theist doc doctrines. And so it's, it's funny that you're, you're both agreeing. Yes. Simplicity does bring us that way. So I'm going to qualify this simplicity because I don't think scripturally we ought to go that way. Whereas they say, especially history, I love these guys, but they are some of them. I love them so much. They're slaves to history in a way that I don't want to go. And they say, no, the tradition come with us. And I'm like, guys, I don't know if I can. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 And I don't, <laughs> I, I don't want to be uncharitable to anyone or dismissive yeah. to anyone. Right. Right. Well, I think it is helpful for us to be quite clear on what our theological commitments are. Totally. And for, for, for those, some that are, that are operating uh, within this arena, they want, they want to say something like, I, I cannot depart from the scripture. The scripture has to provide the metaphysical lens uh, rather tradition, some tradition, some some set of tradition has to provide the metaphysical lens through which I read scripture. Mm -hmm. And yet scripture should be normative over everything else. Right. And my question is a simple one. How do those two things fit together? If you're, if you're reading scripture through a, un, a uniquely normative metaphysical lens, that then how can that lens be normed by scripture? Because you're already only allowing scripture to be read in that way. Yeah. It's okay for us to recognize and say, well, I prefer that lens. I think it has a better chance of making 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 sense of scripture. So I'm going to start with that lens mm -hmm. and then treat it as defeasible, right? It could yeah. be challenged, it could be defeated. That yeah. that's fine. We all have to do something like that. Yeah. Uh, I might start with a more with more with more, more minimal categories and be less confident than others would be. Uh, maybe, uh, but that's fine as long as it's defeasible and as long as you actually intentionally subject it to challenge, right? Like when I'm reading scripture, I'm continually kind of trying to read it with the sense that I might be wrong. Yeah. And when I read others, I think, oh, maybe they've seen something that I really missed and it just explodes what I've been so confident about. I have to at least in principle be open to that. If I'm going to allow myself to be normed by something greater than I am, God himself, and I believe, believe his word that is in scripture. And so Again, I don't mean to be dismissive to other views at all. There are robust explications of all of these different views. And in this book, because I'm just taking a chapter to deal with, with each attribute, I hope, hope it never comes off as dismissive, dismissive or flippant. I try to use a lot of qualifying language, and I'm just trying to make a minimal constructive case. Uh, and I look forward to further dialogue. But at least those that are committed to the standard of scripture that I'm, that I'm also committed to that share that commitment, I'd be interested in more dialogue around the standard of biblical warrant. How do you actually ground these claims in scripture? And that's where I see that there's something lacking, at least in, in the strict classical theism that I'm familiar with. Yeah, that's that's awesome. I, I would love to make that happen. I don't know, uh, like Vern Poitras just came out with a book and he's trying to trying to, um, trying to explicate classical theis, theism from a very, very like biblically, it's like straight up. Just, and and that's that's a really interesting project, but I think the, the strict classical theist guys are, are gonna have a, have a hard time with that as well. So there's a lot of people working on this right now and I don't know,
if you guys are all talking with each other or if there's something in the water or just an accident of history or something, but it's really cool. All the new uh, work that's being done on, on the attributes uh, yeah. with, with that in mind, I want to jump in uh, to, to another one. Does God have emotions? So scripture at least portrays and depicts God as experiencing emotions and not just emotions, changing emotions that are responsive to creatures in history. There's a few things that, that I, that I want to say there. Of course, it's not a controversial claim that the God of the Bible is depicted as having emotions. Uh, impassibilists agree, passibilists agree that this is the depiction of God. The question is whether that actually depicts God as he is. That goes back to the accommodative uh, rationale discussion. Uh, but if we are actually uh, taking the view that scripture all taken together presents God in a way that's consistent with God as he is mm -hmm. and that the interactions of with God and humanity that scripture depicts are in some sense true about God then the Bible does depict God as having some emotional change and undergoing emotional reactions mm -hmm. uh, so many texts describe this over and over again where God is described as being provoked to wrath, et cetera. And, and, and in Hebrew, it uses the hifil form, which is a causative form mm -hmm. that God is being acted upon. You have uh, God relenting in uh, a nifal form, which is typically understood as a passive form. Um, and, and I wouldn't just rely on, on those forms, just the, the warp and woof of scriptures presenting God as undergoing emotional changes. At the same time, the emotional changes that are described of God in scripture are different and distinct from humans. And this is why that, that analogical understanding is important. So in Hosea 11.8, God puts forth a very robust understanding using highly metaphorical idiomatic imagery. But he says, my heart is turned over within me. All my compassions are kindled. But then the very next verse, verse 9, he says, I am God and not man. So lest you think that I am, I am just like a man, there's where the analogy comes in. Mm -hmm. And so God has emotions, but there's many qualifiers. God's emotions are perfect. God's emotions are never irrational. God uh, often restrains his anger, according to Psalm 78, 38. So it's not outside of his control. So there is a, a stimulus that God is responding to, the creaturely response, creaturely action, but his response is not determined, so to speak, mm -hmm. by the stimulus, right? He's still in control of his emotional reaction in a way that humans aren't. His emotional responses are always proper evaluations of the state of affairs. And so there are many, many crucial ways in which God's emotions are uh, very different than human emotions uh, because they're perfect. And many people want to divide, de deny divine emotions because they think emotions are necessarily imperfections. Yeah. Uh, and I would agree that human emotions are that. And this is why divine emotions are, are very different. Yeah. Um, yeah. There's more to say about that, but yeah. that's the basic idea. Oh, that's, that's helpful. Uh, um, again, to, to preempt some, some strict classical um, theistic uh, backlash or, or pushback that, I like the way you, you describe that because it that makes it completely different than just saying God is just a big a big man. He's just a big man, like the, the God of the Romans or the God of the Greeks who reacts in anger and fury and and is is subject to their own whims. Mm -hmm. Um but but God is perfect in this in a, in a way that's completely different than the descriptions of the Greek and, and Roman and whoever else, you know, uh pantheistic uh gods or god, whatever. So I, I really appreciate that. I think that. I want to just toss this by you. Um, so I, I did my master's thesis defending uh, Van Hooser's authorial analogy from remythologizing theology. Mm -hmm. And I, I wonder if this is a, a helpful way to think through it. I can't remember if, I don't think he used the analogy in his treatment of impassibility, but like um, C.S. Lewis wrote himself into the great divorce and he's talking, he's a character in the story. And he's also the author of the story and he's reacting, you know, with James McDonald and all these different characters and in the story, he's got reactions, genuine re reaction, interpersonal, uh, appropriate responses, and, and uh, he's got emotions. But Lewis is not actually like surprised by what's going on in the story because he's the one who wrote the story. Mm -hmm. And so in that sense, Lewis is, is anal analogous to God in, in what I'm thinking, that he has emotions. He, 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 you can see what Lewis is like by his reactions within the story, interacting with different characters. And yet... He's not surprised by it. He's not on the same level. He's on a different level of reality than the rest of the characters. And so he doesn't experience the emotions the way that they do. Do you think that's that's a, a, a decent analogy or you get some immediate pushback? 
Yeah, I think it's a good analogy. I mean, I, I, I take an indeterminist, an indeterministic understanding of God's relation to the world. And mm -hmm. so there would be some, some nuances that I would hold differently than Van Hooser. But I think the idea that God is not surprised and he's not relating to creation as just another character in the story, yeah. as a creature would, I think that is a very helpful analogy and very important and, 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 and crucial to upholding the creator creature distinction. And here is where I, I want to agree with, with some like, like Paul Gavrilook, uh, that, that at least his characterization of at least some in the early Christian tradition that use language of apathy or impassibility, he mm -hmm. says they use it as an apophatic qualifier, as just yeah. trying to say that God is metaphysically different from creatures. If that's all one means by it, then it would, would not be problematic if it's not ruling out that God actually undergoes emotional change. But as you know, for many, impassibility, at least a strict conception, is that God can't be affected by the world in any way whatsoever. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think that's consistent with God actually having the experiences that scripture describes, having the emotional reactions that he claims to have in relationship to creation. So I would want to affirm something that I call qualified passibility, because okay. not only do I think that strict impassibility, at least as far as I can see, doesn't fit with uh, the biblical depiction of the covenantal God, I also would deny a kind of unqualified passibility or essential passibility where God is essentially passable in relationship to the world, because mm -hmm. that would make God dependent upon some world. Yes. He would need to be in relation to some world eternally, and that would deny the creator-creature distinction. Yeah. So when I say God is uh, passable in a qualified way, I mean to say that God is passable in relation to the world in a way that's contingent on his will. Yes. Meaning he freely created the world. He didn't have to create a world. And then he freely decided to enter into relationship with the world that affects him while at the same time upholding the creator-creature distinction, right? Mm. And so he's voluntarily passable in relationship to the world. Of course, he innately has the capacity uh, to, to engage in relationship, but his relationship with the world is voluntary, so it's qualified. It's not a necessary attribute of God. And so he is, uh, in many of the things that impassibles want to affirm, that God isn't overtaken by emotions, he's not overwhelmed by emotions, he's indomitable, he's inconquerable, unconquerable. All of these kinds of things are consistent with a qualified passability, which doesn't make God a kind of unwilling victim. And yeah. at the same time, you have a God that willingly does enter into, into creation, uh, not least wise in the incarnation, as I understand it, and suffers with us and for us, but in a way that isn't susceptible to the criticism of some forms of essential passability, where many cri criticize and say, well, a suffering God doesn't help me very much because I want someone who can overcome suffering. Right. And I would say, well, the God of the Bible is both. He's a God who suffers with us and identifies with us and even carries our suffering on his shoulders. But to use a bad metaphor, he has broad shoulders. He can carry <laughs> all of it without being some kind of an emotional basket case. And only that, he remains omnipotent and transcendent such that he can and he will bring an ultimate end to suffering. So he's mm -hmm. not mired in suffering like a creature. He's yeah. not overwhelmed by it. He is actually defeating it. Uh, similar to the way... And there's many differences as well, but similar to the way that Christ in the incarnation takes uh, takes on humanity, humbles himself to the point of death of the cross, and is not defeated by death, but he himself defeats death by doing that, right? Yeah, yeah. And this is, this is part of, of the beautiful mystery of the gospel that scripture is, is sharing, where God draws near to us in history, so God is actually with us, right? Supremely in Christ, Emmanuel, God with us, yeah. which means to me that in some sense, God can relate to creatures while still remaining God in a very robust sense. And, and I know there's a lot of pushback that goes in opposite direction and I respect it, but I, I just am convinced this is more consistent with what the Bible is teaching and even just the biblical story of redemption itself. Yeah. You're, you're so um, charitable and, and it's so great that you don't want to step on people's toes. Um, a lot of other people are not like that. So that, that's really great. Uh, I don't think you're going to offend anyone because we all have op opinions and we and and convictions and we can back them up, like you said. So, yeah, uh, I'm, I'm glad that you that you have those. Uh, this I work with college athletes. So every now and then I, I like to use the little snappy um, like catchphrases and stuff. But I, I was just thinking about this, like death happens to us. Um, emotions. Mm -hmm. affection we're affected by our, our our surroundings and someone could just you know flip me off and immediately maybe i get mad but then i have to try and work and control that and stuff god's not like that in that you know things happen to us but god happens to things so like death happens to us but christ happens to death you know you could make these kind of you have to clarify what the heck you're talking about they're not just snappy sayings but i think that's a helpful way to think about exactly what you're saying that god's taking this on it's not mm -hmm. like god created the world and now he's uh 
he's bound to in, in philosophy there's this case of a you you wake up and you have a violinist and they're they're hooked to your kidneys right now you're yeah. stuck and you have to god's not stuck no. the the world is not the violinist and he's not stuck and and the world is happening to him he's actively choosing to be in relation with us and it's so it's it's because of his will uh not because of some kind of metaphysical um emanation or something like that that's right and, and this is what i what again it, 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 i'm trying to capture by using the label of covenantal right yeah because god is entering into it as a sovereign right he's the suzerain and we're vassals right it's, it's not yeah. a, it's not a symmetrical relationship but at the same time i think it is a real relationship but it doesn't reduce god's sovereignty or make him less essentially transcendent yeah. he can remain transcendent in crucial senses while also being imminent with us voluntarily uh he didn't have to he freely uh, and freely creates the world according to Revelation 4.11. All things exist by his will. So he, he's not a, an unwilling victim. Uh, he could be entirely invulnerable to creation. Nothing could, could ever affect him if God chose to be removed from creation that way. But he has chosen uh, in the mystery of the gospel, in the mystery of the incarnation, and I think even beyond that, to enter into history in a way that actually makes a difference to God's life. And I think this is just a beautiful, beautiful aspect of the gospel that, that moves me to worship. I'm sure I haven't understood it uh, uh, fully, uh, but what I do think I understand about it just moves me to awe and worship uh, yeah. for the covenantal God of the Bible. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I've, I've taken so much time on each one of these. I want to I get through some more. So um, does God know everything, including the future? Yeah. So I believe that he does. Um, I believe that the, the Bible teaches that God knows all things. And I think that means at least that God knows all things that can be known. Uh, as you know, there are some uh, process theists and open theists, which the two shouldn't be confused with one another, but they, they do agree on the view that God doesn't know the future. Some say God can't know the future because it's not there to be known. Uh, I'm not convinced by the philosophical arguments. I don't think there's a logical or ontological contradiction with God knowing the future. I think there's, there's more than one potential model. But in the book, I don't try to put forward a particular model. I, I'm content with a kind of defense that I don't see a defeater that comes from that realm that would that would break uh, the possibility of systematic coherence. Uh, and I, I want I focus on the standard biblical warrant where I think there's all kinds of data in scripture that presents a robust sense in which God knows the future exhaustively mm -hmm. and in detail. So you not only have claims like in Isaiah 46 where it says God declares the end from the beginning. Uh, and if that is taken as a mirrorism as inclusive the end, of the end from the beginning and everything in between, which I personally think it should be, then this is just describing God's knowledge of the entirety of history, even though it uses the word declare. In order to declare something, you have to know it, right? Yeah. Uh, so this suggests that he knows it. And that very uh, uh, verse is couched in what some people call the trial of the gods in Isaiah, four, I think, 40 through 48 or 41 through 48, hmm. where uh, God is basically taunting the fault of gods of the nations and saying, if you're really a god, then tell me what's going to happen, Right. And the fact they can't do it, he's kind of using as an argument, well, they're not really God, and I really am God, and I really can tell the future. You have many texts that kind of just make a descriptive claim that God knows the future exhaustively, and then you have many other cases where God predicts things about what creatures will do in the future, or he makes long-term prophecies like in, in Daniel 2 and Daniel 7, uh, and people that interpret these differently, but at least there's long-term claims that involve all kinds of decisions of creatures. So I think uh, without trying to do justice to all the biblical data too quickly. I think there's a, a, a large amount of biblical data, and I don't personally find a way to uh, reconcile that with the view that God lacks knowledge about the future. Yeah. So uh, again, folks, like we can't, he wrote a whole book on this. It took him a year. So we can't go through everything, but you just need to go by the book. Again, it's Divine Attributes, Knowing the Covenantal God of Scripture. Uh, so there's this weird question that always pops up in my head. Um, about like quali qualia states about like, so there's something that's like for me to eat. Uh, um, uh, what's uh, the chicken place? Um, um, I can't think of it right now. Chick-fil-A. Chick -fil Chick-fil-A. Thank you. So there's something that's like for me to eat a spicy chicken sandwich. And I, and I know what that's like because I've experienced that. Uh, does God know what it's like to eat a Chick-fil-A sandwich? And like, does God know what it's like for Parker Sedecase to eat a Chick-fil-A sandwich? What, what do you think? I'm sure it's, it's crazy speculative, but if he knows everything, it seems like he ought to know that. But then there's this problem because he's not me. And, and God, ha it, I don't think God has uh, incarnated to eat a Chick-fil-A sandwich. Um, and, I, and I'm also not sure about like Zeg, Zeg, Zeg Zebski's omnisubjectivity. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I don't know. What, what do you think on that? 
Right, yeah. So Zagzebski makes a strong argument for omnisubjectivity that God's perfect knowledge of every conscious being's first-person perspective, right? So he knows what everyone experiences or knows what it's like to be Parker, right, and and eat chicken or, or whatever your experience might be. Yeah. I think that that is true in a qualified sense. And okay. it, it is more complex than I can probably do justice to here. Sure. But I think it, there's a truth to omnisubjectivity, but there's also some important qualifications. And I'll just mention one here uh, for now. I think it's important, and I think this is this is consistent with what I think Zagzebski wants to affirm. Uh, but I think it's important to to say that God is not indiscriminately omnisubjective, right? So he he doesn't like take delight with the sadist. In uh, yeah. Yeah. So he knows what they feel like in that state of consciousness, but he rejects that as an evil feeling or as yeah. a feeling that is inconsistent with his nature, inconsistent with his character. Yeah. So I think we can both say that God has knowledge of the first per person perspective of creatures without saying that those perspectives ever become God's own first person perspective. Yeah. So he knows it while also knowing that he is a distinct self, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that God is a distinct person and so he never confuses yeah. the first person perspective. He knows that is yours and mine, and it becomes his own first person perspective, if that makes sense. It, it's I think that does, that, but that's no, the basic idea. I think that that's a really, a really clear and helpful point to make. Um, and that, that leads me to think then God knows what it's like for individual humans to sin, even though God doesn't know what it's like to sin himself. God can't sin. He can't deny, you know, he can't right, lie. Right, he can't right, right. So God doesn't know what it's like to sin as God. But that's he knows right. what it's like for Parker to sin. And he rejects that. Yeah. 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 The, in, yeah, the indexical is very important there. Right. Yeah. So he, he, he can never know. I know what it's like for I myself, God to do this. Yeah. yeah. Very important. Distinction. Okay. That's great, man. I can't believe we, we did that in such a brief time. That was great. Um, okay. There's a couple more that they're that really like stick out to me. Um, well, we got to go with, uh, does, does everything occur as God wills because you have a, your, your own particular take on this. Yeah. So, so I'm an indeterminist and I, I take the view that God doesn't, not everything occurs as God ideally wills. Mm -hmm. And I make a distinction uh, between God's ideal will and what I call God's remedial will. It, it, it corresponds in, in most significant respects to what many think of in as God's antecedent and consequent will. And what I mean by God's ideal, ideal will is what God actually prefers from any time onward. And his remedial will I take to describe God's will that already takes into account the free decisions of creatures. Huh. So I, I believe there is evidence that God grants creatures a kind of minimal form of libertarian free will that I minimally define as the freedom to do otherwise than God actually prefers or otherwise than God ideally desires. And I ground that understanding in what I take to be a lot of biblical evidence that God actually has unfulfilled desires. And there's all mm -hmm. kinds of texts where God says, I wanted this, but you did that, right? And even some texts like, like in Luke 7 that says they rejected God's purpose or literally God's will for them. And so there does seem to be cases where God's will in some sense is unfulfilled, where God does not get what he wants. And yet there's another sense in which all things work after the counsel of his will, the way Ephesians 1, 11 says it. Yeah. And I think both of those things can be affirmed by something like this distinction, right? If, if Ephesians 1, 11 is talking about God's remedial will, that we don't have to, indeterminists don't have to try to uh, kind of do theological gymnastics with the text and say, well, it doesn't mean all things after his will. I think we can just say he's talking about his will that already takes into account some of the things that he doesn't want. But I think there's a lot of texts that describe God as having unfulfilled desires. And if those texts actually describe things that God actually wills, not just counterfactually wills, in other words, he's not just saying, I would will this if the world were different than it was, right? Uh, which is, I, I think, the claim that that many determinists end up having to make mm -hmm. but if he actually wills that if, if things God actually wills end up being unfulfilled it seems to me that that minimally undergirds the the conclusion that creatures can actually do otherwise than God ideally desires so it's more complex than that again and there's yeah, a lot of nuances yeah. and, and and I know there there's arguments that can be made in response to that and I try to deal with some of them in the book but that's the basic idea yeah I like the I like the language I thought it was interesting can you can you um maybe briefly, I don't know if anything could be brief uh, in this topic, but um, relate that to like the decretive will and, and um, prescriptive will. 
I, I always mix and match the, the language because everyone says them differently, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, just, yeah, just yeah. for the audience. Yeah. Yeah. So I speak of it. So I speak of it in terms of, of uh, from the terms perspective of the, of the hidden and revealed will, right. The hidden corresponding to, to that mm. will, right. And so the hidden will is what God actually wills to take yeah. place on the determinist perspective and everything falls within that hidden will or will of decree. And then his revealed will is what he says he wills. And on that view of the two wills, there are some things that God reveals that he wills, but are inconsistent with his hidden will. Yeah. And, and so there is a story that tries to make sense of these statements where God appears to say one thing, like he wants everyone to be saved. Uh, if you, if you take texts like first Timothy two or second Peter three, nine, that says the opposite, he doesn't want anyone to perish. Uh, if you take them as saying that God really does want to save everyone, then there appears to be a problem. And the way determinists try to try to, at least some determinists try to resolve that problem is to say, well, God really does want everyone to be saved, but he wants something more than that, which is his hidden will, whether it's his glory to be manifest or something else that's a divine glory defense. Mm -hmm. um, I have significant worries about whether that move works for the, for the determinists uh, on a number of planes um, at the level of manifestation of God glory. I'm not sure why a deterministic God would need an external manifestation because he could, at least in principle, determine that creatures maximally recognize God's glory immediately. Yeah. yeah. Um, you have... I think problems with saying that God actually wills something that's inconsistent with something that he, that he desires more. Yeah. If determinism is true, I think that runs into some problems at the, at the level of saying God actually wills. I think the determinist, I could be wrong about this, but I think the determinist is going to have to end up saying something like God would will that everyone be saved if the world was different than it is. In other yeah. words, if God had willed the world to be different, or if God's own essential nature was different. Um, but I don't, but I think then that means we have to take those claims that God desires everyone to be saved kind of euphemistically. Yeah. And, and I don't, I don't think, I'm not sure you can read second Peter three, nine in a way that's consistent with a euphemistic claim. I mm -hmm. think God really does want to save everyone in a strong sense. And I'm not sure there's a way to reconcile that um, with a, with a deterministic story. But again, I, I, I don't want to be flippant right. and be dismissive. That's just my understanding. And I try to make a case for it. Um, and I make a case for this, a, a longer case, because this is, uh, in this book, I deal with, with things in just one chapter, these different attributes, but I deal with this a bit in my my previous book with Baker, Theodicy of Love, where there's a chapter where, where I unpack this even a little bit more about God's, uh, what would have to be counterfactual desires, I think, instead of actual desires. And I'm not sure that counterfactual desires can account for the, for the claims that God makes. It, it would seem to me like God is being somewhat disingenuous mm. when he says things like, uh, why will you die, O house of Israel? I have no pleasure in the death of anyone. Turn then and live in Ezekiel 18. Or when he cries out to his people in Psalm 81, right? Uh, that I wanted you to turn and I would have I would have gladly restored you, but but you wouldn't do so. Or even, even Jesus lamenting over Jerusalem, right? How often I wanted to gather you under my wings. Uh, as, a, as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, I wanted to gather you, Jerusalem, but you were not willing. Yeah. Um, yeah, the leaders. I, I got too many Calvinists that listen to, that know that they will go. No, no, he's talking to the leaders there. Um, yeah. So I'm. A, I'm a, yeah, yeah. Even so, even with right. the leaders, I still think there's sure. there's something going on there. Sure. I'm a, I'm a, a theological determinist myself, and I'm, I'm not offended by by anything. I think it's so important to read, especially like accounts like yours, because hey, what if we're wrong? You know, like if we're wrong and we're saying something wrong about God, and you can help us think through that. And if not, then at least we got a. a one of the best cases against us that we've thought through and said, Hey, look, I, I still think I can make sense of this even. So I, I definitely, man, I appreciate it so much. Um, yeah. We I don't have to, I don't you know, as well. Yeah. I yeah. feel the same way. I could be wrong as well. And I want to learn from the best accounts yeah. on all sides. Yeah. That's, that's awesome. So I, I'd love, we got to, I'd love to have you back on to talk about that sometime, not, not debate, but just to, to flesh out those ideas. Maybe I need to read that book that you mentioned uh, as well. Um, I wanted to end with, with just one more, um, uh, okay. Is God, is God all powerful? Yes. I, I think scripture depicts God as capable of doing anything that can be done. Yeah. Of course, this doesn't involve uh, any logical or ontological contradictions, but that God is all powerful. He's just referred to many times as almighty. Uh, we're told that uh, he can do all things, that nothing is too hard for him. So God is omnipotent. He has all power uh, that, anyone could possibly have and can do anything that it is logically coherent to do. But I do think, again, consistent with the indeterminism that I hold, I don't think that God uh, exercises all of his power. And I think that he also grants power to other agents that he, that he doesn't control in a deterministic way. But he is all powerful and he is also sovereign, uh, not in the sense that he determines everything, but in the sense that he rules over everything. 
Hmm. And again, if it's true that God has exhaustive definite foreknowledge, even though he grants indeterministic freedom, he can ensure that his remedial will, his overarching will, will in fact come to pass in a very robust sense that I think upholds a very strong view of divine sovereignty, while also recognizing the, that, at, at least as I understand it, there are many things that happen that God does not want to happen. He does not desire evil. He doesn't want evil in the world. And yet evil does not overcome him. He overcomes and defeats evil once and for all and remains sovereign uh, all, all the way through the story. Yeah. I'm I think that's that's yeah. I appreciate that. That that's really good. The, the reason I think this question is interesting is is the the why of it all. So so why can't God do something logically uh, impossible like square a circle and until the um, maybe may, maybe Descartes believed this. I don't know if he actually did or not. But you know, um, <laughs> yeah. a lot of people will emphasize the will of God. God's will is, is all important. So we have to say that God. I think Ronald Nash brings up this point in in his uh, the conception of God. Or, yeah. Um, the Cartesian worry or the alchemist uh, is God's will. Uh, and so people emphasize different aspects of God's uh, nature, I guess, his will or his, his rationality. So why is it? Um, I know that you don't want to say there's a platonic realm where the law of non-contradiction exists and God has to look up at that and say, no, okay, now I have to create. So why is it that God can't, um, in, from, your, from your conception, uh, make a square circle or something? Yeah, yeah. So, so I think I think that a kind of possibilism view is going to to run afoul of just what God describes about himself. So I think there are kind of metaphysical arguments that one can make as as to why, if you're going to say that God can just do anything by his will, that this is going to reduce to absurdity. And then you're going to have big problems saying anything intelligible about God, because right. once you allow the law of non-contradiction to be, to be broken, well, then where do you draw the line? I mean, how, what kind of contradictions are acceptable and, and what are not? I know, uh, I don't think even J.C. Beale is making argument for a particular kind of contradiction that we should just accept. Uh, I really worry uh, about about taking that route. I think the, the law of non-contradiction, even if one wants to say, well, uh, God is God, and so I don't want to rely on some external logic. Um, I think we can learn from that logic. But somebody who wants to take that route, I think the law of non-contradiction is just assumed in the biblical story, right? When, when mm -hmm. Jesus says things like, you can't serve God and mammon. Yeah. That seems to be, I'm not saying he's asserting the law of non-contradiction, but it seems to rest on the law of non-contradiction, right? Yeah. Um, and I, but I think at a more fundamental level, even just putting the, the philosophical claim aside for somebody who, who just wants to say, well, God is God, so he can do anything whatsoever. Um, I think the way C.S. Lewis puts it, I, I can't remember exactly how he puts it, but he says, you know, uh, nonsensical things don't become sens sensical all of a sudden just by applying the words God can before them, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. To say God can do two contrary things isn't to assert anything about God. And to say God can't do two contrary things isn't to lessen his power in any way, because we're mm -hmm. not saying he can do anything. He, we're not saying he can't do anything that is meaningful. And so yeah. some of that uh, breaks down, uh, some of the criticism omnipotence, I think, break down into semantic conundrums that don't hold up under the weight of philosophical scrutiny. Yeah. But at the foundational level, I think scripture just asserts uh, that God cannot contradict himself, which yeah. requires something like that when it says things like in 2 Timothy 2.13, that God cannot deny himself. When it things, says things like in Hebrews that his promises are unbreakable, that he cannot lie. All of these kinds of disjunctive claims, I think, require uh, that kind of a view. Yeah. And if, you, if you're willing to, to go beyond that and say, well, God can do something even that involves a contradiction, then I wonder if we can speak intelligibly, intelligibly about God anymore. And then we can say things like, you know, God saves everyone and God damns everyone. Right. Well, there's a contradiction there, but he's God, so he can do it. But yeah. then we haven't really we haven't really said anything. And so I'm very sensitive to the view that that God is God and he can do things far beyond our imagining. There can mm -hmm. be mysteries. It might be that some places where we draw the line where we, we think we know God is this way or God is that way, we're just wrong and God is greater. And so there may be things that we think are contradictions that that turn out to not actually be contradictions or tensions or paradoxes that are are explainable at another level of reality, yeah. right? Uh, like a, a greater dimension of reality as opposed to kind of a flat land or something like this sure. uh, that, that, that makes sense in a way that doesn't actually amount to a contradiction. We just don't understand it yet. I'm entirely open to that and a kind of reverence for God that says, well, I'm just not ready to say, uh, I'm, not, I'm not so confident about what I know that God can and can't do. Yeah. But I think at the basic level, if we're affirming scripture, God can't deny himself. Yeah. And, and, and I don't know how you get away from at least a minimal kind of law of non-contradiction there. And you apply that to God's power. That means God can't do anything that would be an internal contradiction or that would contradict his own, his own essential nature. Yeah. 
I think that's that's it right there too. Yeah, like the, the um, you can do all sorts of metaphysical grounding of the law of non-contradiction as a proposition in in the mind of God, or that that the truth maker that makes that proposition true is God's nature. I think that's probably right, and I think that's yeah. probably what Scripture is saying in that He cannot deny Himself. So there's not some law that He has to look to, but it's His own very His very own consistency, His own nature yeah. that He does not go against. And George Mavrodes makes uh, makes this point in a, a puzzle puzzles about omnipotence, mm -hmm, something like that, mm -hmm, where mm -hmm. where he says, you know, actually, when you analyze these these tasks, like lifting a rock that's too big for him yes. uh, to to lift, making a rock too big for him to lift, it's actually when you analyze it, it's him denying himself. It's that's like right. saying, uh, can the God who can make any rock or lift any rock make one that, that he can't lift? It's like, yes. no, that's a that's going against his nature. So he can't. He's limited by his omnipotence. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think the way I understand his argument there, he's it, it's smuggling in a contradiction that isn't really yeah. there. Yeah, and I agree with you. In some sense, I think that these that these necessary truths, the way some describe them, are grounded in God in some way. Yeah. Uh, but I think even if the metaphysical stories we 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 tell to make sense of the way in which it's grounded turn out to fail, I don't think that means that the claim itself right. fails. Right. It, Amen. The biblical claim is is more fundamental to that claim. Yes. Which is why I, I I tend to stop short of committing myself to a particular metaphysical story, and I'm mm -hmm. open to multiple ones. And if there's multiple ones that can ground the same minimal claim, I'm ha I'm happy to have more than one that is consistent yes. and doesn't yeah. amount to contradiction, even if I might favor one more than the other. Mm -hmm. um, but I also respect and appreciate very much the, those who do try to push one and show, say this is the one and make. The strongest arguments they can make because we can learn a lot from them. Yeah. Uh, but I don't want my at the end of the day, I don't want my dogmatic claims to rest on the success or failure of what I have, what I think I have reasoned out to be the only way things things are or might be. Because yeah. if I turn out to be wrong about that, uh, I think there's a more fundamental claim that goes beyond the fallibility of my reason that I I don't have that much confidence in. To be frank, that's that's so. Like that is so good for me to hear. I need to hear that. And I appreciate you saying that. That's like, you know, really discipling me right now. I I, I appreciate that because because you're absolutely right. Yeah. The biblical foundation is so we can have these stories that, that might fit. Hey, might, you know, I'm not holding on to these the same uh, ferocity, ferocity, veracity, yep. ferocity that I'm holding on to the, the scriptural claim that God does not deny himself. That's awesome. I think that's how uh, any good theologian ought to be. Um, Dr. Peckham, thanks so much for all your time here. This is fun. I, I really you know, peppered you with questions and appreciate you being able to, to recall them so so quick. I know like this project was a long one and uh, it's actually it's super impressive that you're able to just jump jump on like that. I, I appreciate your um, your attitude too and that you you don't want to step on toes. you're not here trying to be blatantly you're not you haven't called anyone heretics, which um, some people on the other side uh, often often do. Um, so I, I just I appreciate that and I just want to let you know like a lot of us younger theologians coming up, uh, we need examples like you, and so I'm I'm so glad that that you are just a great example for us to emulate. Well, thank you. You're very kind. It, it's been a pleasure to to talk with you. I've really enjoyed it, and I, I really just for me, theology is an act of worship, mm -hmm. and that means itself has to be humbly subject to the God who is greater than ourselves. Yeah. And so I think the theological task has to be one of of trying to understand, right? Faith seeking understanding. And I have to be to open to humility and correction, and that requires a level of charitability and a willingness to be at least as self-critical as I am critical of others. And I don't always succeed in doing that because I'm like every other human and, and you know, have my you know pride and, and selfishness and other things that we struggle with. But I think this this is one of the hermeneutical virtues that we should aspire to and, and try to model in the way we dialogue with one another so that we can learn from one another even where we disagree. And at least those of us that agree on the standard of scripture, we can we can rally around that as a common standard and say, well, I disagree with your interpretation. I think maybe it amounts to contradiction here, here, or here. Uh, but at the end of the day, if I actually thought scripture taught that, I would agree with you. And we have some standard that's greater than ourselves uh, that we can that we can look to and have a dialogue around in a charitable way that's seeking the truth that is always greater than any of our, our limited fallible understanding. So so again, thanks for having me on. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Well, that's um, that's gonna have to do it. Lord willing, we can uh, continue this conversation in the future, but for now, that's all. Uh, this has been Parker's Pensies. Again, go grab the book, Divine Attributes, Knowing the Covenantal God of Scripture by Dr. John Peckham. Uh, as always, all glory to God.